Done on News Talk 106 to 108. As mentioned earlier, they are generally regarded as one of England's greatest ever bands, and the album Steve McQueen is one many people would name check as one of their favourite albums of all time. I certainly would. Uh, Prefab Threads haven't made records in quite some time, but at last, this week, Prefab Threads' new album, Crimson Red, was released. Frontman Paddy McAloon is currently the only member of the band, and he joins me on the phone. Paddy, uh, welcome back. Thank you very much, Tom. How are you with praise, Paddy? <laughs> you know what? I, I'm I'm kind of shy of praise, if I'm honest. I I, I don't know why. I just I just feel I, I I tense up a little bit with praise. It's lovely. I I I hear the genuine warmth from people. But I've got. If you ask me directly. I don't. Sometimes sometimes don't know what to do with it. There are times, though, when I interview people and I think you have to skirt around the issue. You have to try and not mention the fact that <laughs> <laughs> on one level you love them. <laughs> well, that's, that's a very honest thing. That's a very honest thing to say. That, that, is, that, is, that is great. Um, there's, only, there's only one thing that's actually worse than that, which is a very recent thing, which I've noticed has crept into, into press reports. And I can't even believe that I'm, I'm bringing it up with you because I think it's a terrible thing. But when someone says to me, <laughs> how do you feel about being a mythic creature? <laughs> Which one or two people have said to me. And I feel so, I'm, I feel kind of, um, you know, so, so, so um, thrown off my stride. So I thought I'd just say that to you oh, right. now in case we headed off down that route. No, not going down that route. I'm going to park what I've said, you know. Right. It's going to be like the elephant in the room between us. That's but great. I'm going great. to move away from it now. Okay, well, I get professional with a again. Some introduction. <laughs> All right. Um, how are you? Is I'm, is I'm the not question? Bad. Good. I'm not bad. I've been through the wars of various things, um, but I, I'm I'm pretty good, really. I'm delighted to hear it. I'm delighted to Thank hear it. We, we read a lot about you in the papers, and it didn't sound good. Um, no. And and is that what has stopped you? Is that why you haven't released an album in so long? No, not not entirely. I, I think I um, I think I, I just got into a very strange mindset, um, which which runs along the lines of life is very short, and if your favourite thing is writing music, um, then just write music, which is which is a wonderful thing to be you know position to be in if you can do that. Um, but normally, um, you know, you would then record the music and share it with fans or, or what have you. And um, I missed that last part of the equation out. I just wrote the music and put it away in boxes. But um, I think it may be, you know, part of the problem was that I had a, a little crisis a few years ago um, where I just thought, I don't know if I ever want to listen to any of this music that I make. And that threw me into a bit of a spin, you know. Right. How did you come out of that? So how, how did Crimson Red come about? Well, well, I, I came out of it because what happened was, um, I, I, you know, you never really stop writing. If you love to write, then you never stop. So um, after um, Let's Change the World with Music came out, the people who financed that were keen to do something else. And I entered into it um, and, and sort of said, yes, I'll do another record and completely forgot that I was, um, that there was a deadline involved, which sounds terribly, not naive, but sounds stupid, but I'd, I'd, I'd overlooked that fact. Um, but it came about because they reminded me that I owed them a record and I thought, fair dues. And um, uh, collected, uh, went, went to, my, to some of my, my archive material and looked and just looked for 10 songs that I thought were good and strong that I could do relatively quickly. That, that's the, basically the, that's how it right. came about. It's very rarely we find ourselves in the position of, of uh, thanking record companies these days, but it, it sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> it's a good one. It sounds like they're the ones put the gun to your head. It was something like, it was something like that. It, it, it really was. And I was embarrassed. I thought, ah... It wasn't as if my manager hadn't said... Um, I remember him saying to me one time, don't let the deadline slip. But I just thought that was a man managerial speak for you'll always be slow. Had he said to me, "Look, you're going to be in deep duda if you don't <laughs> if you right. don't produce a record soon," I might have listened. My God, the idea of an A and R man sitting outside your house with a shotgun <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the way to go. Well, you, you know, the thing was, the thing of it is this: that I really was working very hard on an album for them, right, since about uh, 2010. 
And um, I, 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 t- I tend to do this terrible thing of tell myself stories and then I believe them. And the story that I told myself was that I was working on something really good and I could let let the time slip by as long as I was working on this thing. And I was. I was working on something else altogether. My God. But I knew I couldn't finish that in, 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 in two or three months. And, you know, I couldn't do it in a hurry. Whereas I right. thought, what I need are some songs that I can do quickly. So that's, that's, that's how I selected the material for Crimson Red. And um, I thought that, you know, on some level, I thought, yeah, these songs will go together and all hang together. But I, I didn't... I've got to be honest, while I was making it, I didn't realise that they would... Um, they would form such a sort of, um, t- to my mind at least, a, a, a coherent whole. Yeah, that, that's exactly, um, you took the words out of my mouth, it's cohesive um, yeah, yeah. Prefab so. Sprout album, which, which is I a wonderful is. thing. And for, for those of us who have loved Prefab Sprout and those listening to the show, it's, it's kind of what we would hope from. Um, Thank you. Many of the tracks, um, were, they, they were all just sitting in drawers and, and could have yeah. remained sitting in drawers. Yeah. My God. But to take one, one song, the one that we've played so far on the radio, the, the songs uh, of Danny Galway. Tell me a bit about that. Where did that come from? Oh, now, that, you see, da- Danny Galway, I, I considered that as a title for quite a while. And I loved the title. I thought, I, you know, I, I, before I had a melody or anything, I thought, a song called The Songs of Danny Galway, you just can pour out all your love for music into that. Get yourself a fictitious um, name and write about some songwriter that you like and invent a career for him. And then I remembered a, a trip I'd made to, um, to Dublin, as it happens, in the early 90s um, and, ha- and had a, a wonderful experience um, with Bill Whelan and um, Jimmy Webb um, singing The High Women for, uh, was it an RTE program. I, I don't think I was terribly distinguished on it, really, uh, but Jimmy Webb, I thought he sang beautifully. And um, and I recall this 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 meeting with a boyhood hero of mine, Jimmy Webb. I should have said that first of all. Right. Uh, you know the composer of Which is the Lineman and um, uh, and Where's the Playground, Susie? And I think everyone knows his songs. Really, yeah, by the fantastic time. songs. Um, you know, twenty great songs at the very least, all classics. And um, it was it was when when I, when I came to write Danny Galway, I thought, well, the songwriter this this will be about. It will be Jimmy Webb, and it'll be about our time in. Uh, our day in, in Dublin where um, he flew in from America and um, I will just pour out all my affection for him and my thoughts about the power of music and the power of song um, which I've been storing up since I was about 11 really which right. is when I first heard Wichita Lineman God what an effect that had on so you it's a love letter to him really well, you know. I'm going to play it now for people in case they haven't heard okay. it because it's an absolute jam the songs of Danny Galway um, that is the songs of Danny Galway, one of the news tracks from Prefab Sprout, the album Crimson Red, which got released on October the 7th. And Paddy McAloon is with us tonight on the phone. Paddy, fans um, are aware that you're the only one on this album of the original of Prefab Sprout, but are you in contact with the others at all? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm in contact with, um, obviously, with my brother Martin and with Wendy Smith um, all the time. I haven't seen Neil, uh, actually, since um, we last played live. It sounds, that sounds really terrible. I know he lives in France, and um, and he does, uh, you know, he still does music and things like that. But the time slips slips by terribly. But no, um, the reason I'm I'm kind of all alone on the record is is, is due to my hearing problem. You might think, well, if you've got hearing problems, you could do with some help. But the way it works is that um, I'm very tentative around um, around loud instruments, electric electric instruments, and I've just got into a habit of of working. Um, with you know, with uh, sound modules where I can produce a, a level of volume that doesn't uh, hurt my right ear, which right. has been damaged. And um, ideally, you know, I, I suppose what I would do is when I make these kind of rough versions of songs, I would get real people in to replace various parts. But the truth of the matter is, particularly when you're, you're in a hurry, you try to make every element of it work um, with every other part. So I, I program a lot of the music, um, you know, and the arrangements myself. And then I, you have what I what I sometimes call the Jerry Anderson problem, which is, you know, if you remember the puppet master of um, Thunderbirds and Stingray, things he, like that. Yeah. Um, he would, he, you know, he would sometimes make these programs, and if you saw a real hand suddenly appearing in the middle of all this plastic, 
it did <laughs> look a bit strange. So I think what you don't want is when you've built up this carefully constructed fake world with a computer and things is to have one real thing there. Right. So I try to I try to minimize all that stuff and just do it with computers and, and make a kind of band sound. Now, luckily, okay. um, luckily, uh, my brother Martin, he kind of just sees where I'm coming from. He, he thinks, look, just do what you're comfortable with, and maybe we live to fight another day. So I'm very lucky in that. Right, and and Wendy, whose whose vocals on previous well, albums were were much loved. Of course they were. Well, Wendy left a good while ago. She left after Andromeda Heights. Yeah. And um, she now she does other things. Right. But I talk to her quite a bit, and she's she's always been a, a big fan of what I of what oh, I do. Great. So they're very very supportive. You might think everyone would be furious of what I'm doing, and the truth of the matter is I'm shifty about talking about it because I know that people love. Um, I'm not the I wasn't the only person in the band, and you might like the songs, but there were, you know, Neil was a fantastic drummer, but I just reached that point where working alone. Um, it is it's, yeah, it's easy for me. Working. The other thing is it's difficult for me to judge um, certain frequencies. Not to get too oh, technical, right. but okay. bass frequencies in particular, I, I can't judge. People, so I, I, you know, I, have, I have to cheat and use okay. pre-programmed Fair things. enough. Um, people will also be wondering about the other... Are you able to play live? I suppose, theoretically, I could play an acoustic guitar. Okay. Um, oh, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is I could stand up and, and let a drummer blast away behind me, but you wouldn't risk I'll it. tell you something. If, say I'm, say if I'm in the house and there's a, uh, you know, there's a CD playing, and if I just think, oh, I'll turn that up a bit and really get into it, I, I suffer for it. Okay. I feel a, sort of, a, a kind of strange and an, an uneasy feeling in my chest. And it's, the, it's something to do with the ear not really liking the volume. So, All oh, right. You know, to play live, it would it would have to be an acoustic experience, and um, that's not quite what I want to do. Okay. Um, do you ever listen to the old material? Do you ever listen to Steve McQueen? No, I never listened to it. Although I have to say, I was in a I was in a, a, um, a radio studio in Newcastle um, yesterday, and they put a, a little sort of collage or a medley of bits together, and I heard Desire Eyes for the first time in what must be fifteen years or something like that, probably. God. And it sounded good, and I, I kind of I missed Tom Dolby's keyboards. You know, the the opening yeah. chords, the desire sounded fantastic to my damaged ears. Right. Um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't listen to, to 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 specific records because I write a lot of new music. Okay. You move on. My head's full of new stuff. Y- you mentioned Thomas Dolby, and I heard a story once, and I'm wondering if it's true that um, you have the songs for the Steve McQueen album, and he came to your bedroom and you played <laughs> them to him. Yeah, yeah. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he he did. I wish I, I wish that was a story that you know would involve um, some voluptuous Hollywood actress, perhaps. But that's you know, I would be lying. Yeah, I used to write, um, you know, in, in in proper since boyhood and student fashion. I, I would write on the corner of a bed playing an acoustic guitar. And um, when he came to the to the house, um, that's where I, I, you know, that's where I played. And so I just he came up and he sat on the bed and I played him this thing and. A bunch of songs, and he, 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 at the time, he smoked. You know, we're going way back. And yeah. I remember him taking out a, uh, a packet of silk cut or something and writing down titles on the back of the, the silver, the foil paper, you know. Yeah. He must have thought it was Christmas. <laughs> That's a very kind of... I think he was struck... Yeah, I think he was struck by a few of them. And then um, and then when he, went, when he went away, there were certain things I don't think he'd heard. Like I don't think I don't I don't think I ever played Appetite for him when he that day that he came to see me and, he, and I didn't play Desire Eyes, um, so they were things that I that I added to it, newly written things. Wow, they're such wonderful songs. Thank Appetite, you very much. I, I adore. You like those? Yeah. yeah. Where does that come from? Do you remember? Which one? Sorry. Appetite. I don't know where that comes from. I, I you know, a lot of my, my songwriting methods, I I, I I I make sense of everything afterwards. I'll I'll, I'll sit there and I'll you know just make sounds or get it, get, maybe get half a line. In, that, in a particular instance, I can't remember what the starting point was, whether it was the opening line of the song or part of the chorus. It, it was written in, let me see, 1984. Right. Normally I can, re- I can remember a lot about the writing of songs. That one, I, I, I can't. I do remember that when we, we were, we were re- routining it and rehearsing it for the very first time, that um, the a and man, my a and man, Muff Winwood, um, he was a wonderful man but I remember him leaning over the my shoulder 
when I played the keyboard. And he was looking to see what the title was because I, I think his, his I'm, I'm just guessing his feeling was, I do hope this song is called um, So If You Take It and Put Back Good because, you know, it's the first line of the chorus. Yeah. But me being me, songs were called um, Goodbye Lucille yeah. uh, rather than Johnny Johnny and that one's called Appetite and it mentions the word in it but, you know, Muff never really mentioned that afterwards. I, don't, yeah. I think he must have thought, oh, it's a shame you couldn't make the first line of the first line of the chorus the title A and Orman have that quality that's that's what they yeah, bring to the well, table th- they do he was he was a, he was a particularly um kindly and uh, and warm man for that sort of job i you know I, I think of him with great affection in fact i got a lovely message from him um when he heard this i have no you know i have no uh, professional connection with him now yeah but when he heard the songs on crimson red he said you really must send the devil came a calling to Tom Jones, which I thought was a great, wow. great comment. That'd be great because that would get that song out there, which <laughs> would be brilliant. Do you think he'd like it? You never know. You it just never know. Quite appeal to him. Yeah. Um, I'll just ask you about one more for I'll let you go. Love breaks down. The, yeah, the, yeah. the song that eventually released four times eventually became a hit <laughs> um, which many songs Danny Wilson's Mary's Prayer I think got released nine times that's a beautiful record beautiful. I, I really love that song Mary's Prayer it's fantastic where did Love Breaks Down come from? I think um, well, well, let, 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 me, let me address this in a roundabout way my, my sister-in-law never liked the fact that um, Fire and Rain by James Taylor when she found out that it was actually about his band breaking up. She thought that was such a terrible story to tell about it's such a great song that it was, you know, inspired by the breakup of a band or the yeah. duplicity of the bass player or something. And I always bear that story in mind when I when I when I talk about when Love Breaks Down because I suspect right. part of it was that I was looking for a hit. Part of me was thinking, that's a good title and then you then you then you forget those kind of thoughts and you try and write something that is that is true that, that often happens that the songs will start in the most bizarre and unpromising circumstances and then you do your thing with them and the I'm not spoiling that for you no the magic happens not ruining it Thank at all you. not ruining it at all uh, Paddy it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you um, I hope you managed to work out something to perform because I think on behalf of many people we'd all love to see you we'd love to hear those songs again um, live if it ever happens it would be just such an enormous pleasure for so many people but it's great to have you back and it's great to have Crimson Red and I'll be playing it to death Thank you so much. That's, 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 those, are, those are lovely sentiments. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Daddy, thanks for joining us. God, keep them coming. If we're going to talk to people like him every night, I'll, I'll do an extra hour, lads. Um, vinyl on the way from the band.